Yeah, so today we are very happy uh, to have David Gaiotto and uh, he'll talk to us uh, about applications of twisted quantum field theory. So we are very happy to have you talking to us today and uh, yeah, thanks for accepting the invitation when, when you're ready. Yeah, yeah so I will uh, essentially give a first attainable overview of uh, interesting applications of, uh, of twisted quantum field theory that has strike, I found striking over the last few years, and then perhaps specialized to one more specific calculation that I've done uh, last year in a holographic context. Uh, so twisted quantum field theory, uh, what, what is that? Uh, the notion of twisted quantum field theory comes from the notion of supersymmetric quantum field theory. So in, in, on general grounds, when you have a supersymmetric quantum field theory, you have some collection of odd supercharges, uh, which anti-commute to the translations of the theory. And twisting the theory just means to find some important linear combination of the supercharges and pass into cohomology, essentially simplifying the quantum field theory to, to, something, to something which is still a quantum field theory, but it's simpler, might have fewer fields or uh, simpler Lagrangian if you want and manages to capture the properties of the original theory, which are protected by supersymmetry. Um, when you twist the theory, one of the most obvious consequences is that the theory tends to become either topological or homomorphic or some combination of the two. So what happens is essentially that the, when you take the anti-commutator of your selected supercharge with other supercharges, you will get some linear combination of the positions, or the, of the translations. And these translation generators are now exact in the cohomology. And so they essentially drop out from your theory. So if you have some real translation generator in the image of your charge, then uh, that direction is just topological, it's gone, meaning that correlation functions will not depend on the position of operators in a direction and, and so on. And typically things can be deformed in the direction freely without changing the answer, uh, as long as you do it continuously. Uh, if you find a complex linear combination on the right hand side, then the real and imaginary part will sort of define a plane. And uh, this, this relation is telling you that the theory does not depend on antihelomorphic translations in the plane. So that, that those two directions become a complex direction where the correlation functions only depend holomorphically on your complexified position. And depending on your supercharge, on the number of dimensions, the number of supersymmetries, you can find various possibilities. So you could have something topological, homomorphic, or something where part of space time is topological and part is homomorphic. And all of these statements, both the topological and homomorphic, hold in cohomology. And uh, uh, so these are sort of cohomological. Topo topological quantum field theories or holomorphic quantum field theories. Uh, in other words, uh, it's not that the stress tensor say is zero, it's just Q exact, or some components of the stress tensor are Q exact. Um, now, part of the reason I'm seeing so many interesting things happening in this subject is that there has been a lot of mathematical progress in understanding of twisted quantum field theories. Uh, first of all, thanks to the work of Costello and others, most twisted quantum field theories are now rigorously mat rigorous mathematical objects at a perturbative level. And uh, as a lot of calculations are actually one loop exact, but not all of them, uh, this often means that you know a lot uh, mathematically about your theories. Furthermore, uh, the general axiom satisfied by these topological or homomorphic quantum field theories are also better and better understood which means that you can often combine the rigorous general framework and the rigorous uh, perturbative calculations to derive some non-perturbative results. Um, and so in essentially, essentially this means that while in the past, the, general, the, the typical situation was physicists do some calculations in these quantum field theories and then encode them into some mathematical object, produce conjectures, and then give the conjectures as black boxes to mathematicians. Now there is a, a, a community of mathematicians which really understand what you mean when you say quantum field theory. 
uh, and can actually derive results about quantum field theory using tools which are maybe unfamiliar to physicists and producing results which go beyond what physicists knew about these theories. So there is a robust exchange of ideas within physics and math at the moment, and also within mathematics and mathematics in the sense that quantum field theories tend to uh, connect uh, different areas of math. The different aspects of the same quantum field theory might involve algebra, category theory, algebraic geometry, or homotopy theory. Um, and uh, I think this is also an, an interesting, you know, an interesting development. So sometimes you really get connections between mathematical subjects which are thought of being uh, unconnect, unrelated. Now, um, David, David yes. I, I used to. Uh, some people would tell me that, you know, if topological theory physicists should not be interested and so on. I would always remind that the topological, it's topological maybe as a word, but in reality, it's a ground state of the physical theory. So if you are interested only vacuum structure, which is a very physical question, uh, yes. the, the word topological always confused physicists. So I just want you to make a comment that people forget that it's equivalent to the knowledge of everything in a vacuum sector of the physical cell. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's the theory often captures things like the space of vacuum or uh, and these protected quantities associated with quantum field theories to test the quantum field theories can be matched across dualities or along the RG flow. Uh, and in, I really want to understand what these new mathematical results about twisted quantum field theories imply for the physics. Um, right. Now, in recent times, you know, topological quantum field theories also became important in condensed matter physics, uh, although those are typically unitary, these topological quantum field theories, uh, as opposed to the homological quantum field theories, which tend to be not unitary. Uh, this procedure of twisting typically ru ruins uh, unitarity. Uh, but um, it is true though that there is a certain degree of intersection, uh, although not quite well explored, in the sense that in statistical mechanics, nobody forces your theories to be unitary. Right, you can encounter things like logarithmic quantum field, logarithmic CFTs, or things like that, um, and also not unitary topological field theories, presumably. Although I haven't seen it done, and uh, some of the results I'm going to discuss give you, say, information about logarithmic CFTs out of topological twists of supersymmetric gauge theories. So I think there is a little bit of a potential interplay there. Uh, another interesting observation is that some of the quantities computed in these protected theories uh, can be used as sort of a seed to bootstrap the physical theories. Uh, I've been quite, I found quite striking that in recent, recent work on bootstrapping, say, the CFT that lives on two brains or any of four super meals itself, people use as input uh, quantities computed using sphere supersymmetric sphere partition functions and correlation functions on this protective correlation functions on sphere so again studying these twisted theories might actually give you the seeds to capture the full physical theory if you are good enough at bootstrapping um, okay uh, in what i'm going to discuss there is a lot of interplay between different dimensions. Uh, one way this happens is because defects play a very important role in the study of twisted theories. Uh, local defects are essentially local modifications of the quantum field theory, which behave in a way as a lower dimensional quantum field theory embedded in the original one, although this perspective can be deceptive. Um, in particular, when you have a defect in your theory, you have some spatial local operators that live on the defect, which is different from the ones that exist in the bulk. Um, there will be different symmetries. Some of the symmetries will be broken by the defect. Um, 
And obvious symmetry is block is, of course, translations. If I put a defect here and I try to translate in the direction perpendicular to the defect, translation will be broken by the defect. Because supersymmetries tend to commute to translations, some of the supersymmetries also have to be broken by defects. But some can be preserved. So you can have BPS defects which preserve some, some of the supersymmetries. And if those supersymmetries include your new potent Q, then the defect can survive the twisting and becomes a defect in the twist theory. And this gives you sort of extended observables, which sometimes is important because you might have no local observables at all. So in the topological, in the topological quantum field theory, it's often the case that, so in a unitary topological field theory, there are really no local operators. In a more general topological field theory, you might have some interesting space of local operators, but it's typically not very rich uh, compared to the amount of information that is in encoded instead in defects. And in a unitary topological field theory, only the defects carry information, like the anions in the, in, the, in, in the study of phases of matter, which are line defects in the line energy theory. Uh, another way you can sort of move between dimensions is compatification. Again, you can take a quantum field theory in some dimensions and make space part of space compact uh, to get a lower dimensional theory at low energy. And if your compatification is compatible with the twist, this can be done for the twisted theory as well. And it's a typical strategy to get manifold in back. So you, you pick a manifold, you compatify your favorite theory in that manifold, and that gives you a lower dimensional theory which encodes the geometry of, which encodes some properties of the origin of this manifold you compatified on. And so you can sort of convert geometry to the algebra of this uh, lower dimensional uh, field theories. And the two, setups can be combined in the sense you could put maybe some defects inside this internal manifold. If you say you want to study not invariance, you would take a sphere perhaps and put some, some defects which wrap some curve in the sphere, some not in the sphere. Um, okay, so I'm going to discuss phenomena that occur in various dimensions, starting from dimension one. Any questions before I get there? Okay, so the canonical example of a twisted uh, one-dimensional quantum field theory is the twist of supersymmetric quantum mechanics, uh, which is essentially what lies behind the written index or the quantum mechanics interpretation of most theory or whatnot. Uh, essentially, in quantum mechanics, you just have your Hilbert space and you have the super supercharges acting on the Hilbert space. And so taking the cohomology is literal, of some supercharge is literally taking the cohomology of your space of states. And it identifies the vacua of your quantum mechanical system. Uh, but you can also have one dimensional topological defects within higher dimensional theories. Uh, this form a category typically or some derived, derived version of that because they're in this sort of cohomological world. Simply because if you have a collection of line defects, between each line def to each pair of line defects, you can associate the local operators which live as junction between the two. So your object to the categories are the lines and the morphisms are just the spaces of space. And this is a category simply because if I have a topological line and I start with defect one and I map it to defect two and then to defect three, I can compose these local operators to get a map from defect one to defect three. And these categories often have monoidal structures simply because I can take two defects and fuse them. And the details of these structures depend a lot on what's going on with the transverse directions. So I might have some, some kind of you know, meromorphic monoidal structures that are holomorphic directions transverse to the defect or that can be braiding, perhaps. Um, it's really a, a big zoo of possibilities. Um, another sort of thing that can lead to one dimensional system is, this, as I said, compactification on, on, on space. I take space to be a compact manifold, and then I just have time. Uh, and this is a typical way to get categorification so of interesting manifold environments. So, you know, your typical way to get a categorified not invariant, say, is to take a four dimensional theory uh, and put it on a compatible three manifold, say. Um, okay. Now, as you go up in dimensions, you get 
to shoot a range. So there are many two different possibilities because you can either have an holomorphic twist, which makes the theory chiral, or to have a topological twist. An holomorphic twist is available as soon as you have two chiral supercharges. So the sort of the typical theory, which is holomorphic twist, is zero comma two theory. Um, this, after you twist, you get something which is holomorphic. So you get the local operators have holomorphic of E, so you get the chiral algebra. You get a quite a special chiral algebra because you have a modular invariant partition function given by the elliptic genus. So it's a true two dimensional chiral algebra as opposed to, uh, so, I mean, it's sort of a, a non rational analog of an holomorphic chiral algebra, uh, which is a true two dimensional theory as opposed to a relative theory. Uh, this sort of theory was, this sort of twist was studied quite a bit uh, years ago in the context of hydrotic strain. But typically, this was applied to sigma models. Uh, since then, there has been a lot of progress in understanding zero comma true gauge theories and their elliptic genera and, triad and dualities. And I think this is a nice would be a nice time to explore again the holomorphic twist uh, in two dimensions. Uh, perturbatively, you get them essentially from a gauge theory gives you a gauge beta gamma system. So you get, get, get a beta gamma system with some BRST. Uh, charge. But no, the, it would be very interesting to figure out if one can describe mathematically the non perturbative corrections to these perturbative statements. But perturbatively, this is fully understood. There is a nice paper by Silly which uh, does everything. Uh, now, if you have four supercharges, you can do a topological twist. And there are two types of that A and B twists. And here is a context in which you can start having topological line defects or boundary conditions. There are big categories involved. This is the universe of mirror symmetry and, and, and whatnot. Uh, I mean, there, are, there is so much math that has been done connected to the top, to topological twist of 2D theories and their categories of boundary conditions. Um, something that you know I find very fun, for example, is the connection to the definition of star products and conservation formality theorem, which arises from just looking at the B-twist of three fields, of three kind of multiplets. And I sort of take it as an inspiration of the sort of things you could be doing in higher dimensions. Uh, like, uh, something which I should perhaps mention is that the topological twists can be seen as the deformation of the homomorphic twist, which um, allows for some interesting uh, shenanigans, which I've seen not much in two dimensions, but I think happen a lot in higher dimension, which is that you can first use the holomorphic twist to go to a complex geometry world where everything is done using algebraic geometry, and then uh, do the topological twist to do topological calculations using this complex geometry. It's like there is, it's, it's with like a Riemann Hilbert correspondence. So you study, you know, uh, flat con local systems by, by in terms of holomorphic flat connections of the modules. Uh, anyway, it's it just something which I think has been uh, underlying a lot of the mathematical efforts to define uh, topological quantum field theory using algebraic geometry. The algebraic geometry is often there because you could first do an holomorphic twist and then the topological twist. Um, so three dimensions. In three dimensions, you are looking at three dimensional and called true gauge theories. These are interesting theories. They have a lot of uh, physical phenomena which you which are analogs of you know interesting dynamics of non-supersymmetric theories. Things like particle vortex line, for example, of current 3D and called true gauge theories. Uh, and they admit an holomorphic topological twist, which is not something which has been studied a lot at all. Uh, and a, a nice mathematical characterization of this holomorphic topological twist is still a work in progress. But there seem to be a lot of interesting structures. Um, there are topological lines which extend along the topological direction and form some kind of a category with some neuromorphic monoidal structure. And there are boundary conditions which are holomorphic and so support chiral algebras 
the sort of the most general type of collateral. We don't have a, don't even have a stress tensor. Um, and you know, an idea which I've been thinking a little bit about, and I would like to think about more, is that this convention I got to theory is twisted. Uh, could be used to study the deformation theory of Karalabrugas, perhaps in a way analogous to what Konsevich did in one dimension lower. And anyway, there is just a lot of physical dualities which can which still a way to be translated into mathematical language. Uh, but, and conversely, I, I would really like to know if this, what physics is captured by this holomorphic topological twist. Uh, this is, you know, it's much less than what we're used to work with. Uh, I don't know how to compute, you know, correlation, interesting correlation functions in this in this homomorphic topological twist. Most of the structure is encoded in some uh, intricate hybrid operations where you apply descent relations to to take operators and make them into forms and integrate the ground other operators. Uh, so I think it would be lovely to know if this sort of data can still be carried over to the physical theory in a useful way, I don't know, uses a feed to feed a bootstrap or something like that. Um, now, if you increase the amount of supersymmetry to n equal four, then you start getting topological twists, uh, three-dimensional analogs with the A and B twists. And here, the relationship with mathematics has been developed much more already. Uh, part of the interest came from the guess that these three-dimensional theories had something to do with a phenomenon called symplectic duality, simply because, uh, so the symplectic duality pairs up uh, hyperthelic cones. And uh, when people look at the list of pairs of hyperthelic cones, they look a lot like the spaces of vacca of three-dimensional n equal four theories. And so people have been trying to understand the connection since then. And one of the outcomes was that Brahma, Fink again, Nakajima learned how to multiply BPS monopole operators exactly, which is something which physicists did not know how to do, but they knew how, only how to guess. And so um, the mathematicians could give a, a precise definition of the Coulomb branch of these theories, uh, which I find fascinating. And the hint that, right, mathematicians are at the point where they can teach us things about quantum field theory, not just proof theorems we, we can point at. Um, and really, right, this is a setting where probably a lot of that right geometry appears because there is underlying the deformation of the normal fit topological theory twist. Uh, so work in progress, you know, people are trying to study the two category of dimensional topological boundary conditions. Uh, there are two categorical versions of mirror symmetry involved. Uh, there are line defects, topological line defects. And interestingly, there are also homomorphic boundary conditions which support uh, logarithmic Karal algebras, which are sort of almost rational. And there are interesting relations which generalize the relationship between just some theory and WSW models, where the category of lines is related to the category of modules for these logarithmic Karal algebras. And there are presumably also interplays between the topological boundary conditions and the homomorphic boundary conditions. Statements like, I don't know, the two category is the two category of uh, conformal extensions, modular extensions of the logarithmic uh, Anyway, so this is mathematically still being worked out, and I think there is interesting physics uh, as well. Uh, okay, now uh, I could keep going in dimension. There is definitely a lot of things, uh, a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, I would mention at least the holomorphic twist to for the n equal one theories, simply because four dimensional theories with n equal one supersymmetry are physically very interesting. They have confinement, they have car symmetry breaking, uh, they have all sorts of physics phenomena that we really care about. And I think nobody has really figured out if the holomorphic twist of these theories can tell us anything about those topics. And uh, so it's something I'm working Sorry, on. David, on uh, yes. Uh, that uh, uh, ju just might be uh, mm -hmm. some precision related to the previous slide. I'm just yeah. wondering, that's a quite generic statement, but the, is there uh, a good understanding of how this, uh, for example, hom holomorphic twist could be arising, or holomorphic and topological slash topological twist could be arising on, on, on the cases when, for example, you have 
uh, sigma integrable complex sigma model with a complex homogeneous complex target space, which through the uh, symplectic reduction could, uh, could lead you to the chiral gross Navon models. I'm just wondering if if these twists could be understood on on either side. Uh, or, for example, if I'm twisting certain version of the integrable sigma model, if I would understand how it is reflected on the say on this gross Navon chiral side. Uh, um. This is two-dimensional case, uh, I would presumably think. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the B-twist of sigma models is was asked it in theory. Uh, right, and uh, I think people understand reasonably well the two categories associated to it, or at least trying to understand. Uh, then if you, if you know the 3D mirror of the, the sigma model, if you, have, you know some gauge theory with Coulomb branch is the sigma model, then you could try to match it with an A twist of that. But I've been mostly, yeah, they mostly focused on gauge theories, partly because sigma models are not UV complete. And so they're really secretly always, I mean, if you want to have a sigma model, honestly, it must arise from a gauge theory somehow. Uh, but I think a lot of the yeah. mathematical yeah. abstractions work, even if the theory is not UV complete, which is something that always find peculiar uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay I, I, und I understand your point I, I was just thinking if there is some uh, you know deep relation to the chiral algebras uh, or which are which could be rising uh, at the level of chiral uh, al algebras of these gross number models but uh, like anyway, I, I, this, I don't know I don't know yeah because these buzzer fermionic gross number models like they, they could be viewed as a spe specific series with a certain structure of the quiver variety and several of those, like out of those, whenever the, their target space is a quiver variety, mm -hmm. uh, in those cases, there is a possibility to, only in those cases, when, when this is true, uh, there is a possibility to get certain non-trivial interacting sigma model, which is integrable. Mm -hmm. so, I, so, yeah, but... so on the on the B side, in a gauge theory, the mm -hmm. holomorphic chiral algebras, which often occur, look like gauge beta gamma systems. <laughs> right. There are other possibilities, but uh, I mean, I don't know the, the, top, the complete list of holomorphic boundary conditions. I understand, I understand. And uh, if there is a relation between the category of modules of certain algebra. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So as I categorize, like there, there is no full categorification, right? So, of, of, of... so at the moment, I think people have found the uh, good correspondence in very specific examples, like Abelian, the theories, they can, I think some authors have begun understanding which categories of modules in the vertex algebra have a chance to match okay. the category okay. lines. Uh, okay. So I think it's doable. And, uh, right. And in the, on, the, okay. on the A side, your chiral algebras look like sort of WZW models for some bizarre super super Kasmuli algebras. Uh -huh. and, uh, what those words actually mean is still not completely clear in the sense that I see. Like when I say WZW model, I mean some kind of a... You mean WZW type, uh, probably. Right, I, I mean it... Uh, right, you know, so WZW, WZW is not Kasmuli, right? It's It's... A quotient and sometimes also an extension of that moody. And so okay. I did an analog of that notion for for this super Katsmuli uh, algebras. And has not been done, I think. Uh, so yes, thanks. Right. So right, so for the equal one and homomorphic twist, quite open. Uh, mathematicians have started looking at it uh, perturbatively. There are for the analogs of vertex operator algebras. It would be interesting to understand it better and to see if there is any insights about non perturbative physics. Um, there are tons of twists for dimensional equal two theories. I'm not going to go over them. They go from the ancient, uh, ancient topics like Donaldson theory to more modern, to uh, more peculiar ones like holomorphic topological twists. Uh, there are also uh, interesting, you know, constructions involving normal deformations, of course, uh, which is something I've not mentioned, but 
it's another way to reduce the theory in dimensionality if possible. As you twist the theory, it's possible to sort of throw away some directions in some situations by doing things equivalently for rotations. So this is the notion of omega big town and can be used to in, in a lot of ways in, in, in several of these examples. Um, another particularly interesting topic in that emerged in the study of four DNA culture theories is that there is a way to extract a two-dimensional chiral algebra out of them. Uh, this actually came out of the bootstrap program, funny enough, uh, but has often interesting properties and has been studied mathematically. Um, and then there is the other twist of four-dimensional nimple four theories, uh, which includes a, a, you know, a collection of topological twists. There is an A twist, a B twist, and a whole intermediate family of capustin britten twists. And these topological for the theories have deep relation to the geometric line one program. Some are really reasonably understood, some are being still being studied. Um, you can compatify this theory with the surface and circle, you get relations to various aspects of the, of the, of the line one program, but are also boundary conditions which have all the properties of these three vehicles for theories. So you get connections between land lands. Uh, and symplectic duality and the theory of uh, uh, logarithmic chiral algebra. It's, it's a very rich and complex blob of uh, constructions, which has been explored from so many directions. Uh, and yeah, there are those relations to the quantization character varieties, to quantum groups. It's, it's, it's rich and giving an overview just of that it takes several talks. Um, and there are also constructions in six dimensions, five, five and six dimensions, which I'm not going to discuss, uh, which seem also uh, quite interesting. In that context, most of the theories are non Lagrangian, although sometimes in the infrared they flow to Lagrangian theories. Uh, and so, on one hand, it's harder to do calculations. On the other hand, uh, sort of general considerations about the topological, about the twists of the theories might be some of the best hopes to get information about these theories. Uh, for example, we know that, you know, the omega deformation of the, of the six theories give you W algebras. Uh, and, you know, this sort of information, again, could be used as a, as a, as a to feed into a bootstrap. Okay. Uh, now, something else which uh, I should discuss is the notion of twisted holography. But this is a, sort of a new topic, so if you have any questions about the few slides, this could be a good time. I would say that non-Lagrangian theories always, the way we understand are anyway Lagrangian in a sense that they're part of some other theory in terms of which we describe it. And that theory does have regular description, but just once we decouple or we take some limit, it's a sector. Of, and it's embedded, I, I would say, in the regular theories, right? Well, I don't know. The, the choose your theory is not really embedded anywhere. Well, there are limits of the little strings, and little strings are embedded in string theory. Then we say, I mean, but not in quantum field theory. Well, we don't know quantum field theory for string theory. I, I agree with that, but if if we think in terms of, uh, I mean, they are not that scared. That's what I wanted to no, say. No, absolutely, absolutely. Scared. We have and a language means. to describe in terms of the usual things and some limits and in some. Oh, I mean, absolutely, and that's actually I want, that's that's something I'm going to get to that. Uh, sometimes you can really use string theory to derive properties of these non Lagrangian theories in a rigorous twisted setup. So, uh, right, so to discuss that, I need to introduce the notion of uh, sup twisted uh, super string or twisted theory or twisted super gravity. And a natural context for that is holography. So, and another oh, thing I wanted to add, David, excuse me. Another thing I, I actually like to, in principle, uh, to be mentioned uh, is that there are many different twists, right? As you know very well. So all all these um, 
And for example, in two dimensions, depending what your global group is, you can have a million different twists. And yes. so um, that's that's important to keep in mind. I think that so this is not mm -hmm. a one. Uh, there is a part, four dimensions. There is a Donaldson twist, and there is a twist you like, twist I like. There are many twists. That's what yes, I agree, and uh, I think more effort has to be spent in sort of studying the twisted theories as families over the possible sources of twists. Uh, for example, when you study n equals four quantum mechanics, supersymmetric so quantum mechanics, you can twist in different ways, depending on which new potency of charge you pick. And sometimes the twists look pretty different from each other. And uh, I, I think there are definitely situations where knowing that there was an n equal four quantum mechanical system behind uh, adds information which is not quite visible in, in each of the twists. Uh, there are certain things actually which depend on which twist you pick, but some, interestingly there are universal ones which don't depend. For example, in two dimensions, as you know, if you have a bunch of U1s in the global group, right, as, as many U1s you have, as many parameters you have to twist, right, so you add the uh, string connection to any of the U1s and so on. Yes. Uh, so now you have, suppose the rank is, uh, global group is rank is K. So you have basically K twists, K parameters that you can you can use. But interestingly, in the case of with four supercharges, right, the, when you derive partition function, the part which defines the sum over which there is a sum is determined by beta equation, which does not care about it. But what you are summing does depend. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that has never been a kind of Explain that. See, so beta equation is always the same. So you have sum over same set, but what is inside depends on those many parameters. Yes, and this yeah, is probably I, unique. It's probably only unique to two dimensions. I don't know analogous things in higher dimension. So there are some universal things which are twist independent. That's that's only comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, and sometimes you, you can see one twist as the deformation of another twist studying it within the other twist. Yeah, that's, that's in the example I just brought, it is yes. the case. So I think there is still something to understand about the, the sort of interplay between, between twists. Uh, for example, you know, there are some mathematical words which I keep hearing in situations where there is extra supersymmetry, but it's not quite clear to me how do they actually fit into that. For That's example, correct. For example, words, perverse shift instead of shift. I typ it typically happens when there is extra supersymmetry, but exactly what the connection is is obscure to me. Um, Another good example is if you can find that kind of deformations that you take from Donaldson twist to Kaposian Witten twist, mm -hmm. or to this Marcus or Marcus twist. You know, I mean. In, in, in four dimensions, I don't know. But as I said, in, in two dimensions, there is a smooth K parameter family for the run K global groups that I can describe. Very, very interesting how to relate twists to it. Mm -hmm. okay. But another, another duality is hidden somewhere there. Mm -hmm. That's, sorry, yeah. I interrupted. No, no, it's fine. Um, I, I agree with the statements. Right, so crystal holography. Holog normal holography, I mean, the best examples we have holography are supersymmetric families of supersymmetric quantum field theories, like chemical force super mills, related to supergravity, super string, or theory. And if you apply the twist to the supersymmetric quantum field theories, you can track what happens on the dual side. And, uh, you know, this was discussed by Kevin and Costello again, it involves turning on some expectation value for a super gross or something like that. And it produces a simplified theory of gravity or string theory and theory. Uh, and this has an implicit or explicitly an old, an old story, for example, it goes all the way back to the definition of the topological string theories as, uh, as capturing F terms of super string theory. And this is sort of generalizes this idea. Uh, 
If you do it in the holographic setup, you get sort of simplified, self-consistent examples of holography. You have a consistent twisted theory, which doesn't need to know about the physical theory it was embedded in, and a consistent super twisted gravity theory, which doesn't even need to know about the original theory of gravity, and they are dual. Uh, and uh, uh, it's often the case that the mathematical conjecture of what a twisted theory, twisted supergravity theory looks like, is done with a little bit of uh, either various mathematical manipulations or, or guesswork. Uh, so at the moment, it's often the case that an explicit relationship between the supergravity theory and the twisted supergravity theory is not quite available. And I think it would be very nice if experts of supergravity would devote a little bit of time to this, because it would be often useful to, to be able to say, okay, this particular BPS solution of supergravity is mapped to this particular solution of the supergravity and vice versa. Um, okay. Now, what are examples of this twisted holography? Uh, sorry, sorry, this twisted supergravity, do they depend on background? Uh, uh, because we need uh, basically asymptotic conditions or something. What is, what is a global group? Do they depend usually or should not depend? Uh, so there are a lot of variations depending on what you're actually studying. So often it's the case that some components of the matrix are, are just metric are just gone. So perhaps it's not a theory of gravity anymore. It becomes like a theory of complex structure deformation. So a yes. theory of foliations or, or whatnot. Yes. Um, so the, the example I understand best is the Carroll algebra subsector of n equals 4 superior mills or related n equals 2 theories, uh, which gives you a gauge beta gamma system and which is conjecturally dual to B type, you know, B model topological string for the Spencer theory on the deformed conifold, on the set which identify with the set C. Sort of an holomorphic version of the uh, ADS. And uh, these I've studied in, in detail with, uh, with, uh, with, some of, with, with Kevin and with my student Kasha. Um, and, and I'll discuss it more at the end of the talk if there is a bit of time. Uh, there are also. Yes? Is there a question? No, I said thank you. Uh, and uh, there are also constructions involving the theorem. Of Five brains of the theorem on, uh, on uh, M5 on, on two brains. Uh, and there is an interesting algebra going on. Uh, you know, it, uh, these things involve W algebras or W fine Hecke algebras. Uh, and there is a whole twisted, you know, a whole story involving a, a notion of twisted and theory in five dimensions. And uh, it's a very fun story, very rich. So there is a sort of five-dimensional theory which comes from N-theory. It has topological line defects that come from n brains and holomorphic surfaces which come from M5 brains. And these surfaces support W algebras. And a lot of constructions regarding W algebras can be given a physical interpretation. For example, the coproducts of W algebras comes from fusion surfaces. Uh, there are you know, junctions between two brains and five brains, which, which uh, encode the Mura construction of the algebras. In general, you, uh, you, you, you get a situation where just starting from the very assumption that M2 brains and five brains exist and they have supersymmetric intersections, you can bootstrap up uh, a lot of structure, a lot of information. You can sort of uh, you know, really build the volume theory of M5 brains in this twist by co by condensing together the theory of individual ones, individual M5s, which is a free theory, if you understand. And again, I, I would love to know what, what these algebraic structures really imply for the physical theories. Now, now I, how much time do I have? Is it an hour or, uh, or less? Yeah, it's usually one hour. Okay, so it's still 15 minutes. Very good. So I'll devote the last of the part of the talk to discussing uh, the work I was doing in this context of the Carroll algebra of four dimensional monocle force per meals. So 
Uh, this Caravaggio subsector is, was introduced in the bootstrap context by Castelli, Beam, and others. Um, it, it concerns the properties of certain position dependent linear combinations of the scalar fields of the theory. So, if for a mention equal to theory, you take the upper multiplets, you restrict the upper multiplets to live on a plane, and you, and you take some linear position dependent linear combination of the upper multiplets. And the, the position dependence is tuned in such a way that the free propagator becomes holomorphic. It's sort of something like a Z bar over Z Z bar, it becomes one over Z. And then the miracle is that this remains true when you turn on interactions. So the correlation functions of these operators build out of hypermultiplets form a caval algebra. In the case of chemical force per mills, you have two such linear combinations that we call them X and Y which give you a beta gamma system valued in the joint of the UN gauge group. Uh, the pre, there are also some ghosts also valued in the joint, and there is a BRST charge. So the only effect of the interactions is really that uh, you need to look at BRST closed operators. So that's a nonlinear part of the problem. Once you have the BRST closed operators, correlation functions are computed just in the free theory. There is no uh, no difficulty there. So essentially, you have some collection of correlation functions in this free kernel algebra. And uh, these are independent of the coupling, but they, they depend on n. And the large n expansion of these correlation functions is supposed to match holographically some calculation done in the twisted supergravity theory. So the large, you know, the one over n is going to be the, the coupling of, the, of this dual theory. And the dual theory uh, is conjecturally the B model on SL2C or the form conifold. Uh, this was proposed uh, on, in passing many years ago by, by, by Dagat and Waff, I think, um, but was not explored very much. And uh, what we did with Kevin was to figure out what are actually the holographic binary condition which makes this work. So, this no, essential C is a non compact manifold, and you need to figure out in which sense you can put binary conditions which make this pro problem holographic. So that you have, you know, uh, localized modifications of binary conditions behave as local operators on a plane. And once you do that, you can match with the parallel algebra. Uh, right, this is a problem. So the, the dual theory is a theory of fluctuations to the complex structure of this essential C. Uh, and what I find fascinating is the perspective of cooking up a situation where you have non-trivial gravitational saddles, you know, where there's some kind of a sum of different calabiaus with some asymptotic shape. Because I think that can give you some hints of which we give a computable example of which saddles contribute to pattern integrity, to gravitational pattern integrity, uh, which I think will be fascinating. Uh, one obstruction is that, as I, as I said, we don't quite know the detailed map between B model and supergravity. So if you give me a Calabial geometry with some asymptotic binary conditions, I don't know, do not know how to derive from it a supergravity solution which preserves some amount of supersymmetry and vice versa. And you know, figuring that out would be quite useful. Uh, I was hoping at some point to do calculations in say in the unit in Maldacena the ground. But this has been a bit of a stumbling block. Um, okay, so what I did with Kevin was we defined the holographic boundary conditions. We verified that single trace operators in the Karal algebra match these localized boundary deformations. And then we match some global symmetry algebra, which exists at large n, which essentially guarantees that the three level, so the, the leading in n correlation functions match on the two sides. This address is essentially vector fields on uh, holomorphic vector fields on SHC. It's, it's an example of the sort of high scale spin algebras that uh, people like to study these days. Uh, next, with my student Kasha, uh, we decided to look for a situation where we could see multiple subjects. And doing a super you know, doing Close string saddles was hard, but we thought perhaps you could find 
a situation where you could deal with multiple open string saddles, meaning configurations where you have a fixed bulk, as you see, but you have a sum of different brains inside the set to see with different shapes. <clears throat> so this can be done if you insert the boundary, some operators which create brains, because then your production function will describe the way these, these brains can come together in the, in the geometry and merge. What is the meaning of this determinant now, which depends on M and V? Right, so this determinant operator is an example of an operator which creates a brain in holography. So, so that would be an analog of spectral curve or something? That's right, that's right. So um, the hope is that if we, we insert a bunch of these determinants, they tell us that there is a deep brain that looks like C star going at the boundary of SL2C. And the gravitational saddles will be different holomorphic curves with these asymptotic boundary conditions. And the hope is to reconstruct match these ge 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 geometric saddles to large n saddles in the Carl algebra calculation. Um, there is something that uh, uh, Carlos Simpson defined for higher dimensional Higgs bundles, you know, uh, mm -hmm. which, which has not spectral curve because you are in higher dimension. It's not a curve anymore, it's a half of dimension of cotangent bundle. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it has a spectral cover, not a spectral curve, but spectral cover. Which, mm -hmm. which is, you start with some manifold X, you consider T star of X, and in That's T right. star of X, there is a half dimension, uh, some manifold, which is Lagrangian. And uh, that's very complicated description of, of that half dimension manifold. It, but it plays the role of spectral cover. It's called spectral cover. Yes. So I think that the, the these kind of things, like spectral spectral car has something to do with open strings and closing. You know. Right. So here we have a Calabiao, a three-dimensional Calabiao. And we are studying almost the curves in there. Uh, this makes the problem a bit more analogous to the defining the spectral curve for two commuting Higgs bundles, two commuting Higgs fields, which is a sort of problem that occurs, for example, if you study vacua of uh, for DNA or one gauge theories engineered from a theory, where you have some M5 brain that wraps a curve in a Calabiao. That's a reduction of Simpson case, because in Simpson case, there are three equations of Higgs bundle. Mm -hmm. and the third yeah. equation is absent in case of two, com uh, two real dimension. And that's exactly commuting to two Higgs fields. I mean, it's a five H five equals zero. Mm -hmm. and if you dimensionally reduce, that's always was a good question. If I start with a Simpson higher dimensional case and I reduce to two dimensions, I don't get Higgs bundle of two dimensions. I get something more, many Higgs fields. And another challenge that that SL2C is not a cotangent bundle. Mm. So, I mean, it is a cotangent bundle of S3, but not in a holomorphic way. So, but we did find something similar emerge, which I, I can describe now. It's more like, more like tangent bundle, because then you don't care about the uh, symplectic structure or something. No, I mean, there is no nice vibration, you know, projecting as to see to some base. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a bit of a singular one which sort of comes out implicitly in what I'm going to do. Uh, okay. So let me just uh, show you. So, uh, so we borrowed a trick from, uh, from a paper by Jan Kumatz and basically, which were studying precisely correlation functions of determinants in a free theory. So it works for us because we had a free car algebra. Uh, the trick is to fermionize the determinants by adding some auxiliary fermions. Uh, then you integrate away the for these scalars and you get an action for the fermions, which has quartic uh, terms. And then you integrate in some new bosonic decays of freedom to uh, make the fermionic terms quadratic, essentially the hubbard stratonovich transformation. And the final answer is an effective action for these auxiliary decays of freedom which is sort of a K by K matrix for the K is the number of determinants. And you get some subtle equations, which in the general case of, uh, of these authors look pretty terrible, but simplify a lot in the case of the Karl algebra. So they can be written as matrix equations. So if, if I denote with zeta and mu, diagonal matrices whose elements are the sort of parameters of the determinant, 
these M's and this Z, disease and this, uh, this V, so this Z's and this V's, which tell you roughly in which direction the D brain is going to infinity. Then you get this very simple equation for this matrix rho that zeta commutator rho plus mu commutator rho inverse equals to zero. And if we can find a solution of these equations, that will give you a saddle for the Carl algebra correlation function. And you can find properties of the saddle by out of rho. Uh, for example, you know, the diagonal elements of rho are these m parameters, and diagonal elements of rho inverse are the conjugate moment at length. Uh, so we look, you look at this equation, uh, it, it had, you know, it reminds you of Lux equations or Hitchin equations or something. So it, it's clear you got to build some kind of a Lux connection. And uh, that's what it is. So we, we found that if you define these matrices BCD as a function of the spectral parameter A, which is a kind of like A mu minus rho, A zeta plus rho inverse, and this other combination, then they commute. And they satisfy AD minus BC equal to one. And so when you diagram, if you look for simultaneous again values of these matrices, you get a curve in SHC. Uh, and, and our conjecture is that this is the D brain, which is dual to the uh, quantum field theory saddle. And we verify this conjecture in a variety of ways. So this has a correct asymptotic shape. Uh, you can study the one-point function for a single trace of the vector and evaluate it in the B model. Uh, it has a correct action on the signal of symmetry algebra, so it seems it seems to work. Uh, and it's a nice, uh, I think it's a very nice example of this sort of general strategy that Gopakuma and Gopakuma and Gabriel and other authors have been trying to pursue of trying to find duals to free uh, quantum field theories. Indeed, I kind of would love to use this sort of ideas to explore their, uh, their proposals too. Okay, this is, I think, more or less all I wanted to say. Uh, okay, so let's thank David for a pretty, very nice talk. And then we can, uh, yeah, uh, we can open for questions. If you have questions, can you unmute yourself? And I still wonder if this um, SL2C case can be put somehow in the same spirit as Simpson's case. Uh, I think it's very likely. So if you look at this B and C, they are sort of Higgs, true Higgs fields. Uh, you are basically projecting SL2C, you know, with coordinates A, B, C, D onto the A coordinate. So you're sort of projecting it on a plane. So if you have a curve in SL2C, it will be described by three fields on the plane. Right. This is not a nice vibration. I think there is a bit of a, you know. Yes, that, that's a difference. I think he starts with a complex manifold and then he takes cotangent bundle to complex manifolds and he looks inside. So it, this is, uh, I mean, SL2C uh, is not a cotangent bundle of anything, mm -hmm. as you said. That, but you can think about as SL, SL2R and then tangent space to SL2R. Mm -hmm. Maybe that way. Yeah, I want to keep the homomorphics, the complex structure as much as possible. Uh, See, it has been very little uh, applied to physics, this uh, higher dimensional Higgs bundles. And I was always wondering the uh, moment you go to higher dimension, you have this extra equation, phi h phi equals zero, which, which is something nice that we like the two Higgs fields commuting. Or yes. many many Higgs fields, and it has not been used. And I would be great if this is an example. Mm -hmm. I, I could not find any physicist who would tell me that uh, uh, higher dimensional Higgs bundles appear somewhere. I see. So what I can say here is that um, let's see. So what we have done is to show that if you have any holomorphic curve which is genus zero in SL2C uh, and has these asymptotic boundary conditions, you can find a row that gives you that as a spectral curve. Uh, I, I, I don't know a proof for genus greater than zero and I would love to, because I'd love to know if all the, if all the geometric saddles occur 
as quantum field theory shadows or not. Uh, it's not obvious because, you know, this, in principle, in the, you know, even in the physical theory, the question would not be obvious. And then it's not clear that all the geometric holomorphic curves can be lifted to D brains in the physical setup. So the, uh, in the physical setup, they're looking for the three brains which preserve some supersymmetry. And I don't know how to map them to the of the curves. And that's something but, like Sorry, David, I think that's my, part of my point as well, which I was having regarding when you talk about uh, B brains and G3 maps. Uh, and I was wondering, so the, you're probably not sure if even in this case, like exact map would you demand you some, I don't know, uh, mapping constraints uh, for you to be sure that you really match all the saddles or at least all certain class or subclass of these saddles which yes. measures exactly to the to the curve structure right to, to the right. to the curves in the sl2c that's right so the dictionary between the twisted gra gravity theory and then and the twisted one is very partial at the moment so uh, i expect d brains to go to d brains and d brains in the in the physical theory are super symmetric you know solutions of cap k symmetry uh, capacity yes I actually think that I, I, I want you to comment on the topological string side of mm -hmm. the discussion that you had. Yes. Uh, since now, it is, especially for non compactal LBLs, the topological string is, uh, we understand very well in terms of the basically the generate omega background. I, 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 I'm sure you know what mm -hmm. uh, So. Uh, Seems like that everything formulated uh, here can be rewritten in terms of the epsilon two equals zero omega background because this uh, blow up equation blah 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 gives you directly solution to topological strings. So I, I'm just want to I just hint that the, uh, the, the this this has another way to look at it if we remember. So now we can describe topological strings non-perturbatively, completely, in terms of again omega background. That might break a little, uh, that might break some of the symmetries of the such to see though. Well, when, you, um, when you default the omega background, what you effectively are doing is to go from a so uh, this, the standard topological string corresponds to the ground of the form r2 epsilon times r2 minus epsilon times calabial. If the Calabria is toric, you can perform this to R2 epsilon 1 times R2 epsilon 2 times Calabria epsilon 3, in a sense. So you have sort of omega deforming a bit the Calabria too, which is what allows you to make the deformation parameters different in, in, in space time. Uh, so basically, you are, saying that you are saying that what I said, we don't know if the Calabria is not toric. That's right. And if it's toric, you are picking a direction. You are picking a rotation. But there are relations, right? You, you, that, that was all. I actually, since I have not been thinking on this for many, many years, I was explained that uh, with the blow up equations now, whatever epsilons you pick, you relate to each other. So no, it, it's fine. It's fine. Just that when you pick this toric description of SL2C, you break SL2C symmetry. SL2C symmetry. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, Which is yeah, fine. It, 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 it's a bit dangerous because in the holographic context, because this is a lot of like the, the conformal symmetry. But I, I think it's very possible that, that you could do that. Um, so from the point of view of the quantum field theory side, you are putting these the three brains in this sort of, uh, you know, C, you know, R four times C three with with this more general omega deformation, and we can definitely ask what effect uh, would that have. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know how it modifies the Karal algebra. Uh, it it could be zeroed out. So, yeah. sorry. So this is you know this. This particular example where you take an equal square mills and you do an omega deformation in a plane to get the Karl algebra is just one of many. Uh, uh, just, I, just want you to, I just wanted to, uh, to, to see how much one can think about topological strings 
in now this language, non-perturbative topological strings being something which is uh, not a string at all, but uh, this something with epsilon, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it, it can have a good mileage, you know, thinking that way. Yeah. Also, it, it feels, feels like that because um, for, for, for sure, uh, the fact that it's a non-perturbative completion, not mm -hmm. just perturbative expansion. Yeah. There are also interesting things that one can do with no omega deformations at all. Like, you know, Kevin has conjectural duals for holomorphic twist of any cosmological meals, which is related to some 10 dimensional B model. Uh, all of these things, I think, could be explored uh, uh, prof profitably. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, so to finish, it, sorry, I, I can finish answering the question from Anton. So, uh, so there are definitely examples where supersymmetric brains in ADS5, times S5 can be described in terms of holomorphic data. So there are these beautiful papers by Mikhailov where he studies ADPS giant gravitons in terms of holomorphic surfaces in some auxiliary space. Uh, this is not that, but it has a similar spirit. And I think it would be nice to figure out a similar description where you know you, you describe the brains that preserves this particular collection of supercharges in terms of holomorphic data. Uh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Oh, sorry, maybe the, the very quickly. Uh, when when you have been discussing this, um, uh, the the categorification, and when you have been talking about this, uh, the the surfaces, uh, topological lines, and when when we have been up, uplifting uh, from topological lines, where uh, I can describe these algebraic properties of fusion and merging and mm -hmm. uh, all of this by uh, fusion categories. I'm just wondering if in higher dimensions, this is uh, the, 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 there is also this algebraic language of uh, fusion, fusion tensor categories or, or similar or, or not. Uh, so there should be. Uh, so the, the general language is that of factorization algebras. Uh, the specificalization, uh, you know, I think it's one of those situations where there are some definitions, some very abstract definitions, which in principle tell you what is going on, but in practice, you need to work hard uh, to, to understand what are the actual structures involved. Yeah, yeah, because, it, it, okay, I just have my own motivation that when you have been asking, there is not much known what kind of observables I can uh, obtain in, in such setups, so uh, what could be the correlation functions? Because there are integrable setups, for example, uh, integrable field setups where uh, algebraic properties of the this factorized scattering uh, uh, are, are described by fusion tensor categories. This is, I think, partially what Paul Fendley is trying to attempt. Mm -hmm. uh, and and but there but but there there is uh, it's 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 incomplete definitely. But uh, but there there are attempts for co constructing uh, uh, correlators uh, for for in, in such setups, which whose properties are exactly. Uh, it's okay. It's not. It's definitely not. Uh, uh, how they call this? Uh, uh, TF plus minus. Uh, uh, this is not Fukaya, but uh, this is other type of category. But uh, it, it it looks very similar, like, like to, to those. I think Zohar okay. calls them TF plus minus. Uh, uh. I think it's possible some of those systems emerge as defects in some uh, TFT in a natural way. Yeah, I, but this is the, the, the whole point is that this is higher dimensional case, which you probably, you know, it'll, it'll probably because in one dimensional case, where, when people do have this relation for the topological lines, this is more or less understood, but uh, mm -hmm. in the study and the other, that this is yeah, so, so, so very interesting to me. Topological in any dimension is more or less understood, I think. Mm -hmm. When you start putting holomorphic uh, in the yeah, game, yeah, 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 that's yeah, much yeah. Less sure. Right, but uh, thanks. So you're referring to Mikhailov paper. Yeah, it's uh, trying to remember the title, uh, but uh, it involves 
the description of eight BPS giant gravitons as homomorphic surfaces in the okay uh, in in uh, R two in in C C what was it C one comma C two comma four or something like that he intersects the he intersects them with ADS five times five to find the, the volume of supersymmetric degrees. Okay. 